and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO with Martin Willis and Michael Lauk. Please remember to visit the website, podcastufo.com. Check out the latest blogs and forums. And while you're there, don't forget to like our very active Facebook page. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. Michael Lauk will be joining us in just a second. Today is podcast number 67. It's with Tom Carey about his co-authored book, Inside the Real Area 51, which is about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, Interesting interview, and uh, for right now, we're going to check in with Michael about the news. How are you doing, Michael? Great. How are you doing this week? Well, I'm doing just great. What's up? Great. Well, you know, it's it's kind of a slow news week, but we do have a few stories to bring our listeners, and I would just like to remind everybody that they can find more information about all of our stories through the links in our show notes at podcastufo.com. Oh, I want to say something. Uh, Peggy is off on uh, some type of road trip. So she's the one who manages our Facebook page, and she does all that work. Uh, it's always greatly appreciated. So now I'm at the helm, so it's not going to be quite so good for the next four or five days. But, hey, I'll do my best. Well, maybe she'll check in from the road. Uh, she said no. <laughs> she said she wouldn't. <laughs> okay, fine, Peggy. Be I like s- that. I still love her anyway. Okay, so what's going on? Okay, first of all, we have a controversial new claim of alien life. A research balloon sent up to an altitude of 17 miles by British scientists returned with evidence of microscopic algae found at that height. According to the research team behind the balloon, this algae must have originated elsewhere because it is too heavy to have been lifted to such a height by anything except for a volcanic eruption, and it has been years since a sufficiently forceful eruption has occurred. Other scientists are not convinced that the algae is from off-planet, though. Although it is an unexpected find at that altitude, nothing else in the sample so far suggests that it is extraterrestrial. The team is examining their findings, further hoping to find support for their extraterrestrial theory. Well, yeah, I think I read about this like about a week and a half ago or something like that, and there was some scientist claiming that it might have come in through the, what's the, um, the meteor shower in August every year? Because of the P. Perseid. How do you say it? Perseid? Yeah. Why did they have to make it such a tough name? Perseid. It's all Greek to me, sir. Okay. So anyway, they're claiming that it might have come in that way. I'm sounding like a skeptic, but I think it's kind of a leap to say that it came in from elsewhere. I don't know. What do you think? I think it is the kind of thing that might be evidence eventually, but isn't at this point, a conclusive nail in the coffin kind of proof of, of panspermia, as they call the, the theory that life here began out there. Uh, I did see a show just what was our last night, because we, we taped this a little early, on uh, Discovery Science called The Unexplained Files, and they were talking about a red rain that had been happening. Oh, yes. Have, yeah. Okay, and, and that uh, there was a researcher there who found cells similar to what was found in the red rain in what appeared to be uh the remains of a meteor strike and and he is arguing something very similar who knows maybe yeah maybe i wonder if greer is on this maybe he actually sent something up in a weather balloon you know you just, some... you just can't leave greer alone can you i'm sorry no i can't leave greer alone first of all peggy's going to come on sooner or later and talk about him locking all those people in during his conference. And uh, didn't you know something about him charging admission to an invisible UFO for people to go inside of it? Was it you? Uh, I believe that was Peggy as well. Okay. I just offered to sell people photographs of invisible UFOs. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, they can go to our website, which is podcastufo.com, look at the donation button and uh, donate as much as possible. And we'll make sure to get that to Michael for your picture of the invisible UFO. 
In fact, in fact, they can send me their pictures, and I'll find, I'll circle the invisible UFOs in them and send them back. You could channel them. You get... that, sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sounds good. All right. The next ion drive, or the NASA Evolutionary Xenon Thruster, has set an endurance record after continuously running for over 48,000 hours, or five and a half years. During this time, the engine has consumed less than 2,000 pounds of fuel compared to the 22,000 pounds that a conventional rocket would have needed to create the same amount of thrust. Ion drives operate by pushing a stream of ions, or charged particles, to create thrust. Now, this allows them to use a very low amount of fuel and run for a very long time, but they are extremely slow to accelerate. Nonetheless, they are becoming a viable option for deep space missions. You know, I'm not a, like an astrophysicist or a nuclear physicist or anything like that, but it would seem to me that it would make sense to have a dual thruster system, first of all, to get up to a high rate of speed and then to set this baby into action. What do you think about that? Well, the way ion drives have been working so far, I mean, there's no way you're going to leave Earth orbit with one. Right. So you're, you're going to have to either be built in space or, or boosted on, on some kind of other platform. But, um, yeah, I, I think you're right. But, but I, I don't know that they, you'd necessarily even need two thrusters. Um, you could pull one of the, uh, the slingshot maneuvers, which everyone, oh, yeah. you, you know, the kind of thing they talk about in, in Star Trek movies, for example. Mm-hmm. Right, to, uh, to, to get yourself going and then, and then supplement it from there with the... Uh, with the ion drive, which is just incredibly consistent and um, but very slow, but even a tiny acceleration over over a great amount of time when it's consistent can build to to quite impressive speeds. So I think this is mm-hmm. this is this is a real option for the future. Yeah, I think it's great. It's only ten percent or less than ten percent of the fuel needed. Yeah, and if I, I think if anybody wants to, to learn more about the kind of theories behind this, it's something Stanton Friedman talks about quite a bit That's in right. his lectures. Yes, I heard Stanton talk about this recently, and I actually sat down and recorded with him. He'll be back for the fourth time, and that podcast is coming up on October 11th. And that's great, because it's, al- it's always good to hear from Stan. That's right. Uh, he's a cool guy. Texas sightings get media attention. The media in Dallas is not only reporting on UFO sightings seriously, they are also picking up MUFON reports calling the Lone Star State a hotspot. In a story first run by the Dallas Morning News, which we have linked to in our show notes, and picked up by other media outlets, it was pointed out that MUFON has stated that three of last year's 10 strongest cases came from Texas and that the state is consistently in the top five states for reports. The morning news story also includes a recent sighting by Johnson County Correctional Facility employees. It seems to me that the media is taking this seriously in Texas, and I'm, I'm rather impressed by this. It is. It's great. Um, they need a break from reporting on cattle. Cattle mutilations or cattle? No, just cattle. Okay. <laughs> There's nothing in Texas. No. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm, I, I, I will do it seriously now. No, yeah, it, it is great that they are reporting on it. I think they've kind of had to, partially because of all the sightings they're having recently, but ever since the Stevensville sighting, you know, and its proximity to the the ex-president's ranch, it it has become a big deal there and kind of an unavoidable big deal. You know, I hate correcting you, Michael. I, re- I really do. So keep that in mind. But it's Stevenville. Stevenville. Yeah. I put an extra S in because it's big like Texas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that works. So Cornwall. Yes, the Cornwall UFO Research Group is going to hold its 17th annual conference. Uh, that will be on October 12th, uh, and it will be held at Truro College. Speakers will cover Atlantis, the supposed 1961 Ex- Exeter Interstellar Treaty, and more. And part of the reason I bring this up, Martin, is uh, you've been going to uh, uh, several conferences lately, and I was wondering, how do you select a UFO conference? Well, region helps, you know, as far as not being able to travel. The one I went to in North Carolina, I was real excited to go to because it was more like on the scientific tact. And I have had a couple of people uh, email me, one from the U.K., actually, that said that he will absolutely not go to 
any UFO symposiums, conventions, or anything like that, anywhere near him. He has to travel far. So I think if I was to give advice, if you have the means and you pick one out that you really have an interest in and you're interested in the speakers that will be there, you know, go for it. But if something's happening regionally, at least you can connect with people that have a shared interest. And that's what I really enjoyed about going to the last one in particular. Is there is there anything you avoid? Dr. Stephen Greer. <laughs> I mean, there, you know, there, there are definitely topics that I hear and I immediately just ignore everything that comes after what they say. Um, so, so I, I, you know, I think it's fair to perhaps put Stephen Greer in that category if, if, if you've made up your mind on him. Well, not to give too much of a spoiler here, but in the interview coming up with Tom Carey, we talk a bit about Bob Lazar, and Tom basically says that, you know, Bob Lazar would not hold up in a court of law because once you tell one lie, you know, your credibility is gone. And for some reason, that kind of makes me think of Dr. Stephen Greer. And every time I pick on Greer, we lose listeners. So I apologize if I'm offending anyone out there a little bit. Well, we, I mean, you have, you, you have to stay true to, to uh, your own beliefs and theories and, and – Apologize, you know. I'll apologize to anybody who are Stephen Greer fans out there, but uh, you know we've seen some things that make us question him, and perhaps yeah. we shouldn't pick on him so much. But you know, there are other topics, that, like for instance, I've never heard of the 1961 Exeter Interstellar Treaty. Have you? Yeah. At first, when you read that, I was thinking Incident Exeter, which we actually have someone coming up uh, talking about that topic on our podcast. But no, we're talking about England. Is it is it fair to kind of block out certain certain topics? That, prejudge things as soon as you you hear them yeah uh, well you know yes and you know i have i have uh mixed feelings about you know the abduction phenomena but but i went to the experience to speak which was all about abductions and there are some that are so seem so solid that i kind of agree with what travis walton says why why should i judge i i don't have enough information to judge so I'm open-minded, and, and, and I went to that, and it was absolutely great. So I think, again, if something's happen, happening regionally and you haven't gone to that particular conference yet, go check it out. Why not? Even if it's something you disagree with, you're bound to hear something that you agree with and also meet people that you uh, connect with. I think that's, that's hard to argue with, um, for sure. Any conferences out your way at all, Michael? Uh, there's the one in the Ozarks. I, I heard know, that's really good. I have heard that as well. I, I have to admit, I am not a conference convention gathering kind of person by and large. Um, but it would be great. I'd like to go to one with you at some point and maybe some fans can come uh, hang out with us. I, I could probably, I could probably do that. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, it's, I probably will end up going to one now that now that we're doing this so often here eventually. But you know, I, I'll admit that I I am prejudiced against certain topics. There's certain words I hear, and and I'm gonna I'm going to skip right over something. Yeah, you know, I see that a lot of people sometimes just go way way out there, and they try to go even further. And you know, people listen to them. You know, sorry if you're listening and you're one of those people, but we'll we'll just buy anything. And I just caution to, you know, approach everything with a little bit of skepticism at least um, so you just, you know, don't lose your... Well, your, cred- your credulosity, is that a word? It so is you, now. It is now. So you don't lose your credulosity. Is that, yes. is that what it is? I'm pretty sure that's not a word. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I just made that up. But no, I mean... Yeah, I, I guess skeptic is not a bad word, you know, and and we we do need to be skeptical because other otherwise, why not believe the nice Nigerian man who keeps sending me emails and explaining to me that he has a large sum of money for me? Oh yes, or bases on the moon. Uh, I'm not going to go there. But anyway, Michael, it's uh, it's been fun. Thank you, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Bye.
I'm with Tom Carey. How are you doing, Tom? What do you say? I'm, I'm glad to be with you, Martin. Yes. Now, I've had Don Schmidt on in the past, and we're going to talk about your new book that you did with Don Schmidt, uh, Inside the Real Area 51. I want to talk quickly about this uh, recent disclosure the government did of actually admitting there was an Area 51. That's a very interesting uh, happening, Martin, because, uh, well, the, the Area 51 in uh, Nevada, near the Nellis uh, Test Range, has been in existence in late, since 1955. It was uh, Created, it was established to test spy planes that were under development uh, in the mid 50s. The uh, most famous one, of course, being the U 2, mm -hmm. uh, then the uh, uh, A 12 ox cart, which was a uh, which spun off to the SR 71 Blackbird high altitude. These are high altitude uh, spy planes that. This is before the age of uh, satellites, mm -hmm. and uh, they were built to overfly the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, and uh, one of them was shot down in uh, May of 1960, and there was a big international incident over it. So uh, the uh, Area 51 that we know and love uh, <laughs> became an issue when a fellow by the name of Robert Lazar in the late 1980s came out and said that uh, he worked there uh, because no one really heard 51 when these uh, spy planes, you know, uh, was, you know, no, uh, nobody thought of Area 51. It was only when the UFO connection, the possible UFO connection, foreign technology and foreign life forms the uh, the notion that they were being stored possibly at Area 51, did it become a household name? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the government, our government, uh, it was initially established by the CIA because they ran the spy plane uh, program. But uh, our government, of course, uh, uh, so you know we don't uh, we don't have anything there. No, we 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 do not have anything there. And and yet you could go to uh, Rachel, Nevada, go to that little alley in there that they they created in the back of somebody's pickup, and uh, you could see it. You could see it. So uh, that goes on for a couple decades, and uh, in the 1990s, Bill Clinton is now president. A couple of uh, employees that uh, worked at Area 51 filed suit against the U.S. government claiming that they were exposed to hazardous waste material, that the, uh, 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 you know, the uh, facility had, had they, they had, uh, they were dumping, I guess they called hazmat, hazardous waste material. Right. Mm -hmm. They were disposing of it there, and these people were getting sick, and they blamed it on the uh, improper disposal of hazardous waste material. Well, the uh, cases were settled, and the Air Force, uh, I'll, I'll just say the government finally admitted that, yes, there was, they had a facility there. They had, and they, but they didn't give it, they, all they admitted yet, yes, we have a facility there, but no name was spoken about. And uh, but they at least admitted that they had something there. So that's a mid 1990s. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, here we are in 2013, and God knows I don't know why they uh, finally admitted the the CIA came out. Uh, you know, I guess it was in uh, late July, early August, and said, "Well, yes, we do have we do have a facility. Uh, there was a facility. It uh, was ta later taken over by the Air Force when they created the uh, stealth mm -hmm. uh, B-2 bomber and the stealth F-117 fighter and uh, perhaps uh, something called the Aurora, which is like a myth mythological high-altitude uh, Mach 4 aircraft that some people claim is being tested there. So they finally admitted, yes, there is. We do have a facility there, or we had one, 
and it was called Area 51, or at least it was located in Area 51 on the map. Well, that, that was a couple weeks ago, uh, but the thing was, in, in their release, there was no mention in the official release, which uh, constituted over 400 pages, there was no mention of uh, UFOs or alien uh, life forms or uh, technology or anything. It was just that they admitted that there was a place, a facility named, uh, popularly named Area 51. So, uh, the you know, so UFO guys like us, and I don't consider myself a UFO guy because the only case I'm working uh, for the last 22 years has been Roswell. Uh, you wonder, well, why are they telling us now? Well, the hope is, and I don't subscribe to this, oh, I wonder what the next revelation is going to be. Are they finally going to admit that they have UFOs and uh, alien uh, cadavers stashed there? That's that's the big uh, mystery, is, is if they're preparing us for something, or is this the end of something, so to sort of, uh, you know, make us go away for a while. So uh, that's the question that we have now. Yeah, some people are thinking it's a baby step, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just one more little step to to admitting that. Oh yes. But by the way, we do have uh, uh, we have uh, the creatures there. You know, they're from various planets in the universe. Yes, we've had them for a while. And yes, we uh, we've been back engineering their technology for decades. That's that's the hope. I don't subscribe to it, but but that's the hope. Yes. Now. You brought up the name Bob Lazar, and that he's kind of a controversial figure. You know, some people completely discount him. A lot of people do. Uh, and some people think that perhaps his background was skewed a bit, so people wouldn't believe him. And where, where do you rest well, on that? Uh, you know, Martin, in a, in a court of law, if you're caught in a lie, you are toast. You, whatever you, whatever else you might say, is is on is given no credibility if you're caught in an untruth. And uh, where he got himself into trouble was with his uh, educational background. Mm -hmm. He claimed that he had degrees from uh, two of our most prestigious uh, uh, institutions: uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Mass. Yep. And the uh, California Institute of Technology, better known as Caltech. A check of the records there. Uh, people have checked this out. You know, you can't say anything uh, that it isn't checked out. Uh, maybe he thought we wouldn't check out. Uh, I mean, I didn't do it personally, but uh, they have no record of e Both of those institutions have no record of uh, Robert Lazar ever attending class there. So that uh, sort of... Uh, puts a black mark on not only uh, his educational background, but his whole claim that he worked on alien technology. Um, and, uh, you know, he was he claimed he was an engineer, a physicist, and God knows what else. And so, but the thing is, uh, Martin, if you actually look at him uh, speak in some of these documentaries, uh, he projects very well. He does. He, he, He's intelligent for sure. Yes, he projects like, oh my goodness, this guy is a genius. You know, he he. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like he's telling the truth, but yet he lied about his uh, educational background. So I'm, I, I mean, I have to discount him until something comes along that will clean up that educational background. Sure. There's one other. There's one other thing that is a sort of the stake in the heart, so to speak. You know, the old Bella Lugosi uh, vampire. <laughs> you put a stake in his heart. Um, I have a friend in uh, Florida, another uh, and uh, UFO researcher named Anthony Bergaglia, and uh, he had interviewed uh, Bob Lazar some years ago. And uh, 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 Bergaglia is from Boston, which is just right across the river from Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he interviewed Lazar, and he says, uh, so Lazar asked him where he lives. He said, oh, I live in Boston. And uh, so uh, Anthony said, well, you know, you, you went to Cambridge, right? I mean, uh, MIT. Oh, yes, yes, I was. Yeah, I, yes, I went to MIT. Well, then uh, you, you know where I live. Uh, uh, he said, what is, the, what is the name of the, uh, 
landmark uh, right in front of uh, Fenway Park that every anybody who lived in Boston or Cambridge for any period of time would uh, would know instantly, and he couldn't name it. It was uh, called Kenmore Square, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he and Lazar couldn't he didn't know what he was talking about. So for Anthony uh, Bergaglia, who's an excellent researcher, that was the stake in the heart. Uh, for Bob Lazar, he couldn't uh, he couldn't come up with the Kenmore Square, and, and so yeah. that was it for him. Now I know I do believe George Knapp still believes in him. Yeah. But, yes. Yes. Yeah. And George Knapp is such a balanced and intelligent person. Absolutely. Uh, we did a show with George about a month and a half ago, and fortunately, we we did not get into talking about Bob Lazar. George is a great guy, and there was a great interview, but uh, we disagree about Bob Lazar, and I, I'm guessing that the the people who still support Lazar, and I don't, and I, I guess uh, George Knapp does, I guess their, their position is, well, the government scrubbed their records. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, there's no way of knowing that, but if you're in a court of law, uh, Martin, you know what? You know what would happen to Bob Lazar. Well said. All right, moving on. Can you give a synopsis of your book? The uh, book Inside the Real Area 51 is really not about Area 51 itself. It's about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Hmm. And the reason uh, the reason our, we, we wanted to do this book was because, and, and our publisher came up with the title. We had a different title, but our publisher came up with the connection to Area 51 because everybody recognizes what that is, you know? Right, uh-huh. And it would alert, uh, you know, the casual uh, bookstore browser that, oh, this is about Area 51 or UFOs or something, you know what I mean? Something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but all of your... Roswell books, including the the two that Don Schmidt and I wrote together, uh, Witness to Roswell, first and second, first edition and second edition. All of the Roswell books leave off when the wreckage and the bodies are delivered to Wright Patterson hmm. in in 1947. That's where all the oh you know, the bodies went to Wright Patterson, the wreckage went to Wright Wright Patterson. End of story. Well, what happened after that? You know, so we wanted to put there have been books that maybe had a chapter about Wright Patterson or a paragraph or two. Our entire book is about Wright uh, Patterson Air Force Base and its secret history and Mm -hmm. how it came about. And uh, it discusses uh, the uh, Roswell wreckage and the life forms that were brought there, what happened to them, where they were stored. It answers a lot of the questions that the people have that haven't been answered before. And uh, we wanted to do this in a, in a single book. And uh, uh, there's a lot of new information, not only about the base itself, but about uh, J. Allen Hynek and Project Blue Book. Mm-hmm. And because, uh, you know, Don Schmidt was a, a student of uh, J. Allen Hynek. And there's, he had a lot of information that he's been sitting on for decades and that he wanted to get out about uh, J. Allen Hynek and his relationship to UFOs and the Project Blue Book. And uh, that's a number of chapters in there about that. And uh, so uh, the feedback we've gotten so far, Martin, has been uh, it, it's been just as good as that uh, our, our two uh, Roswell books, Witness to Roswell. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it does seem like a place that always does come up. And what kind of things did you uncover? Well, the first one, let me ask you, uh, you've, you've heard of Wright Patterson, right? Oh, yeah. What, what's the first question you have about it? Oh, well, it's the place where the Roswell crash was supposed to be brought to. I mean, the wreckage. Uh, what specific location there? Uh, Hangar 18. Bingo. <laughs> That's... <laughs> That's the first question everybody has. Is this, is there, where's Hangar 18? Is that where the aliens are stored? Well, we answer that question in our book. It was, uh, you know, because because when we started the book, I, I didn't have an answer for that. I, I knew that the term was out there, Hangar 18. 
I, I know that the uh, information desk at Wright-Patterson, if you go up to it and ask the person there, uh, where's Hangar 18? They'll say, what, what are you talking about? There, there is no Hangar 18, and there never was a Hangar 18 here. And they will be right. They will be correct. And so what happens is you walk away scratching your head thinking, oh, my God, how stupid am I? I feel like a fool. And, uh, but uh, they're actually lying to you. Uh, te <laughs> technically, there, there, there was no Hangar 18, but they know you're asking about the aliens. Mm -hmm. it, that's what they, they know they're at, you're asking about that, and they won't give you, they won't give you an answer. So they send you away with the, there's no Hangar 18 and never was. Well, what happened was it was a, it, it goes back to the early 70s when a fellow by the name of Robert Spencer Carr, they, he built himself as professor, but he, he just had a high school education. And uh, he's down there in Florida. Now, you know that a lot of military people uh, in, in the past have uh, retired to Florida, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, what happened was uh, he, he would uh, give lectures about UFOs. He would, you know, he had a little lecture circuit down there in Florida about UFOs. And what happens, uh, and I know this for a fact, what, if you give a, give a lecture, people come up to you afterwards and say, well, you know, I had this sighting or I know something about this, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And so what happened to him was he had a number of people who used to be stationed or worked at Wright Patterson Air Force Base tell him, well, you know, uh, that's where the aliens were stored, blah, 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 blah. And so what, what he did is he assumed now this is a this is like 1972 73 74 this is long before anybody ever heard of roswell because mm -hmm. the roswell uh book came out in 1980 the roswell incident well he had never heard of roswell but uh these people who were talking to him said well you know there was a crash in uh, new mexico and uh, that's where the bodies were taken that's where the the uh wreckage was taken blah 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 uh, it was uh, there's a hangar there. It's actually hangar 23 uh, where they uh, were taken, and uh, but ultimately they they transferred that stuff to building 18. Ah. Building building 18. Well, when uh, Robert Spencer Carr went public with this story, somehow the the hangar and the building morphed into hangar 18. Ah, uh huh. So it was a, an, amalga, an amalgam of Hangar 23 and Building 18 came out, Hangar 18, and it's still with us today. I mean, I, I still refer to it as Hangar 18 myself today, mm -hmm. but it it's, uh, was Building 18. There's uh, Building 18, Building 18 A, B, C, D, and E, and F. So there's a, a Building 18 complex there that included cold storage, uh, examination labs, uh, you name it. And Hangar 23 was uh, the place where, during World War II, the uh, German and Japanese aircraft were brought, and in the Cold War, the Russian MiGs were brought hmm. to back-engineer them, you know, to tear them apart, to see what made them go, and try to, to uh, 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 build aircraft that would defeat them. And that was done in Hangar 23. So when the the Roswell crash occurred. Boy, what more uh, foreign uh, aircraft or foreign uh, machine could you have than something from another planet? So that's where the Roswell wreckage was taken, was Hangar 23. The bodies were taken to Building 18, and uh, ultimately they uh, spent some time in the aeromedical uh, uh, hospital to be uh, dissected and what have you. But the uh, the main storage areas for these items uh, was uh, Hangar twenty uh, Hangar twenty three and the Building eighteen complex. So that's where it was. But when uh, Robert Spencer Carr talked about it, he talked about a Hangar eighteen. And, and the other thing he was doing was he was resurrecting. I don't know if you remember. Well, you're too young to remember, but you might have heard about uh, Frank Scully 
1950, wrote a book about uh, the so-called Aztec New Mexico. Oh, yes. Yep. And it was, it was called uh, Behind the Flying Saucers. It was a, it was a top-selling book. And it was the first uh, flying saucer book about a crash, 1950. Uh, the crash allegedly took place in uh, March of 1948. But that book was roundly criticized when it was learned that Scully's two sources were two oil con men. And, right. Uh, I remember uh, that. Yeah. I remember reading about that. Actually, we have a blog on our website about that whole situation. Yes. And uh, uh, the the uh, the case has been reopened by a fellow by, by the name of Scott Ramsey uh, two years ago, and he's got a book out on uh, he reopened the uh, the case, and uh, so uh, that's to give a little plug for Scott. But uh, mm-hmm. back uh, back when Robert Spencer Carr was talking about this, he was talking about the the uh, the uh, Aztec case and the bodies allegedly going to uh, Wright Patterson. And uh, unfortunately for him, uh, they, uh, it, they uh, analyzed his data and uh, they debunked his, they debunked the case once again, this for the second time. Really? Yeah. And uh, yes. And uh, uh, they debunked Robert Spencer Carr <laughs> along with the case. Mm. So uh, that, that was that, but the, the term got out. Uh, uh, Hangar 18 was out there, mm-hmm. and it, they made a movie in 1980. Right, same, same year as the um, the uh, Roswell incident book came out, called Hangar 18, starring mm-hmm. the man from Uncle Robert Vaughn and uh, uh, Darren McGavin, the, the fellow that uh, yeah. uh, was in that uh, Christmas movie. And those were the two stars of Hangar 18. I actually like that movie. Now. Does Kecksburg ever come up as being transported there? Yeah. Um, the bell or whatever. I they think, also- uh, yeah, I think Stan Gordon, he, he's the lead investigator on the, on the 1965 uh, Kecksburg, Pennsylvania crash, alleged crash, mm-hmm. that the material was taken to Wright Patterson. And there, there's another story of the Fort Dix case. I don't know if you've ever talked about the Fort Dix case. Mm-mm. In 1978, there was a, uh, in Fort Dix, New Jersey, right next to uh, McGuire Air Force Base. It's a joint base. And uh, there was a report of UFOs over the base. And uh, radar, you know, the radar had them coming down somewhere near the base. And... Uh, Lo and behold, there an alien turns up walking, or you know, trying to get, trying to get over the fence from uh, McGuire oh, to. Oh yes. And uh, it, I heard about this. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, and uh, it's uh, shot by one of the sentries, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, it's lying there on the tarmac or you know the, you know the concrete, and the story is that a plane flew in from Wright Patterson. And uh, they uh, packed it away, and it was flown to back to Wright Patterson. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's unfortunately, this is a uh, the main witness, only one witness uh, who has ever talked about this. And unfortunately, he was last I heard, he was in uh, Indonesia. And you, you know, how can you get to him? Ah, so, yeah. so I I tried to investigate that case. Um, with George Filer, but it, it didn't go anywhere. I, I couldn't get anywhere on it, so I, I basically gave up because we couldn't get beyond that one witness who was away in, I don't know if you call it Malaysia or Indonesia, or, you know, you know, Borneo, Sumatra, one of that, that area. Mm-hmm. And uh, I never did get to interview the fellow, but that's still a case on the books. And uh, the, the cadaver was taken to uh, Wright Patterson. Now, how does your military background help you in your investigation? It helps me in that I understand the military mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a top secret clearance uh, for what I did. But in four years in the Air Force, you get to know how the military operates and what the mentality and the mindset is. Mm. Uh, that, That has been a big help to me in interviewing military uh retired military 
because uh -huh. I, I, I know exactly how they feel about things and what they're talking about. And unless you've been in the military, for, you know, for a couple of years, I'm not talking about getting in for six months and out. I mean, having to actually spend a couple of years in there, it, uh, it's a sobering experience. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, you know, not that I recommend it to her, but it was good for me. And uh, so that's how it's helped me, uh, uh, Martin, is uh, I, I understand uh, when I interview military people, uh, we're on the same wavelength. I see. That's, that's great. Just going off topic just a little bit, I want to talk briefly about Roswell, but I also want to talk about Roswell in the skeptics and debunkers uh, facing off against them. It's one of the cases I always bring up when I'm actually doing some type of debate in regards to UFOs, is uh, mm -hmm. the number one thing I always say is, why on earth would the Army Air Force actually publish in a newspaper and uh, send a press release saying that they caught, they captured a flying disc? It, it just, I mean, just for them to answer that alone, there's no, no right. real answer for that. We, uh, we've uh, gone around and around and around and around on this question uh, we're always asked that question. In fact, Don and I uh, disagreed on it for the longest time. I thought it was a local faux pas by the uh, local base commander there at Roswell. I thought he had just made a mistake. But uh, uh, it turns out because of the uh, uh, Walter Hout sealed statement that it was all orchestrated from Washington. The reason they had to put out, because why would you... If you want to cover something up, why would you call attention to it with a right. with a, you know that was that was my point. Well, the reason they ha put out the uh, first uh, press release the, that they had captured a flying saucer was because the story was already out amongst the citizens in Roswell, going all the way up to Corona, hmm. and it, it was already in the press because the rancher. Mac Brazel, when he came to town, the first person he spoke to was the sheriff in Roswell, uh, George Wilcox, and the sheriff connected him with, uh, uh, well, uh, while he was talking to the sheriff, the radio station KGFL in Roswell called the sheriff's office just looking for you know, uh, local stories that they might put on the over the radio. That was good and, timing. <laughs> yes, yes. He he had the name was Frank Joyce was the announcer, and uh, you know he was spinning records and talking about local stories. You know, and how the cost of cattle feed and that sort of stuff. And he called uh, as a regular course. He co would call the sheriff. Does any you know anything going on there? And actually, they did have a good story. Uh, the country singer Lefty Frizzell was in jail there at the time. Uh, uh, but uh, so he connected uh, Frank Joyce with Mac Brazel, the rancher who brought all this stuff into town. So the story was out. If it, if it wasn't out, they wouldn't have had to put out a press release. So they decided we got to do something here because this story's in already in the press so we got to make everybody feel stupid about this. So they put out the story. They set up a straw man that they had captured a flying saucer. And they were, they were right about that, although they didn't capture it. They, they recovered it. But uh, So that story went out. Well, within hours, within hours, they changed it to the weather balloon story. Mm -hmm. uh, General Roger Ramey in Fort Worth, who uh, the 8th Air Force was the next unit up from the 509th Bomb Group in Roswell. Uh, he ha held a press conference uh, saying that the fellas over in Roswell made a mistake, folks. It wasn't a flying saucer, an interplanetary ship that they found. It was a weather balloon. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but uh, I don't want people who can't tell the difference between a UFO or an interplanetary spaceship and a radar target, a little flimsy uh, tinfoil radar target and a rubber weather balloon, I don't want them to be the group that has their finger on the atomic trigger. Exactly. 
because yeah. they were the they were the only group in the world that had the atomic bomb, and that was their sole purpose of of uh, existence was to, in time of war, to drop the atomic bomb on the other, you know, most probably the Soviet Union. I don't want them with their finger on the trigger if they can't tell the difference between a rubber weather balloon and uh, something from another planet. But that's what they did. They put that story out, and then they it, they took it away with the uh, weather balloon story, and everybody went home feeling stupid. And the press dropped the story right there. That was their main thing, was to kill it in the press, which they did. But the, the other thing was, uh, and you could and you could control it in the military because you they they uh, you, you would say, well, oh, you want to talk about that? Uh, you want to talk about that flying saucer? How would you like to read about it in Leavenworth? <laughs> uh -huh. That's what they, that's what they did. They uh, threatened the people with Leavenworth if they talked continued to talk about it on the base. Yeah. But the but the the, the wild card was the civilians because. Unless it's a case of martial law being imposed, you, they had no control over the citizens of Roswell and the outlying ranchers. So what they did is they enlisted the sheriff to deliver death threats in Roswell to the people who knew, who had actually seen the wreckage, and especially those who had seen the bodies, the little bodies. He, uh, the sheriff Wilcox, delivered. The death threat, we're going to not only kill you, we're going to kill your children if you ever talk about this. Now, to me, that's a violation of your civil rights, you know, hmm. And but that's what they did. And just to make sure, a, a couple weeks later, they brought in this guy from Wright-Patterson named Hunter Penn to, uh, to reinforce that threat. And this guy was a, was a nut job. Uh, it was like... Uh, uh, in time of war, break break the glass only in time of war and, and unleash Hunter Penn on somebody. So he traveled around to the local ranchers uh, with the death threat again, uh, if, if the ranchers ever talked and if uh, the uh, civilians ever talked. So that's how they did it, is they set up a straw man only because the story was out. I if see. it wasn't for that, they wouldn't have, uh, they wouldn't have had these... Uh, series of uh newspaper stories about it and and if you and the thing was uh, martin the newspaper accounts never mentioned uh aliens or flying saucers or, or anything extraterrestrial they they referred to the flying saucer as an instrument now to me that sounds like a little gadget you know mm -hmm. like like a little gadget and they never referred to anything uh that was uh, off planet so, wow. uh, so that's how they dealt with it. And, it. and it worked for 30 years. You know, I never heard that side of it. That's, that's really fascinating to me. One more Roswell question is last time I had Don Schmidt on was quite a while ago. And he was chasing some supposed evidence at the time. And he was real busy. Did anything uh, come out of that? We're still chasing. Really? The same? We're still... As we speak, we're still chasing, to use Don's term. Wow. I, I am, uh, uh, that's all I can tell you. It'll be interesting to see what happens through that. It will be. Yeah. All right, getting back to Wright-Patterson, are there people that are ex-military, retired military, that are actually talking about things that they've seen there? Well, uh you have to understand that uh, if you're 20 years old in 1947, you're, you're very old today. So there aren't many left that are what we would call firsthand witnesses to anything. Very few left. And uh, so we get most of our stories that originate in 1947 from family members. But uh, we do get stories of uh, people who worked at Wright-Patterson. And uh, we have several of, uh, of from family members of people who actually helped uh, uh, construct the underground hangars that that go down as far as ten levels. Really, under under the ground, uh, under Building eighteen and Hangar twenty three. Building eighteen and Hangar twenty three were connected underground, so you could go back go back and forth. 
And uh, today, and if you go on the base, even today, you're struck by the number of air vents that uh, come out of the ground. Hmm. And uh, you're, you, it's only, you can only draw one conclusion, that uh, there's a lot of uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that's underground. It's like there's another city underground now full of vaults and, uh, you know, uh, tunnels and hangars and they go down uh, several levels. Now, today, uh, I know for a fact that uh, Hangar 23 is, uh, has been cemented over. Like really? if you go in, a, you, you, can't, you can't like, oh, well, this, there's nothing underground. Well, they put a fresh coat of cement on the floor so well, to cover up uh, all the entrances to the underground levels. Uh, so um, we don't believe that the, the wreckage and the, and the bodies are there anymore. We believe that they left, uh, were taken elsewhere, perhaps to Area 51 in the early 80s. But uh, all that stuff has been covered over. But, are you saying uh, that it's completely sealed? Well, Hangar 23 and Building 18 are. And all those underground levels are sealed off? Yes. Wow. And, but that's not for the entire base. That's for the Building 18 complex and Hangar 23, and perhaps other, other buildings as well. But uh, it's as though they uh, said, okay, fellas, it's getting too, it's, uh, getting too hot here. We've got to move this stuff elsewhere. And, they, and you know, and they, uh, it, it's like when you're on the dusty trail and you want to cover your tracks, you take a, something to sweep your tracks, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we think that's what they did. Okay. So now I want to talk to you, get your, your take on Chase Brandon, because uh, I've had someone else on the show that thought he was, I mean, I, I thought right away it was really silly that someone would find a box marked Roswell. And according to Grant Cameron, that was just his way of saying it without spilling the beans or a little bit of truth, a little bit of lie mixed in together to actually say something he wanted to say. But what's your take on on that whole situation? Uh, my uh, my take on that, uh, Martin, is that uh, Chase Brandon or Brandon Chase, I don't know which which is the first word. He was selling a book. He had a book that was coming out and he was spicing it up a bit with this. Uh, I believe it was a tall tale. Uh, we've mm -hmm. we've never heard of a Roswell uh, folder in the, that he could walk in and oh boy what do I got here oh this is about Roswell and uh, there's no way to there's no way to corroborate that mm -hmm. his story might be true but there's there's no way to corroborate that and uh, the fact that he had a book coming out at the same time to me tells me he was just giving giving you a little teaser he uh -huh. was throwing out a teaser like oh my goodness maybe there's more in the book about that. And uh, so we, ju we just wrote that story off. But there was another fellow after uh, Chase Brandon with a similar scenario. He, he had a book, and uh, uh, he spice he threw a teaser out that involved Roswell. And uh, all, it, all it is, it, it lets you know that Roswell is still, you know, people are still interested in it. A lot of people think, oh, well, there can't be any more to learn. Well, there, there is. And, uh, you know, uh, somebody like a Chase Brandon or this other fellow uh, might have new information. People are interested in it. Well, speaking of uh, a teaser, we're just about out of time here. But is there another little teaser you can throw away for someone that might be interested in, in buying your yeah. book? Yes, yes. Uh, we have a chapter uh, in the book called uh, The Jawbone That Spoke Martian. <laughs> it's about a strange jawbone that uh, originated at, at uh, Wright-Patterson that came into our knowledge. And it's a very interesting story about this jawbone that it's been exact. I have a background in uh, physical anthropology myself. Hmm. And uh, I at first thought it was a uh, prosimian, uh, like a lemur, you know, the ring-tailed lemurs that you see at the zoo. Right. I thought it might be something like that. But uh, having seen it uh, in real time, at least the, the uh, plaster cast of it, it's too large for 
for it to be a, uh, a prosimian or a lemur. And other physical anthropologists that have looked at it have stated that it's no known primate. They know of no primate or earthly animal with that, uh, that jawbone. So we have a chapter on the jawbone that spoke Martian, and uh, you might uh, find that interesting. Great. So why don't you throw out your website? Our website is www.roswellinvestigator. It's all one word, www.roswellinvestigator.com. Very and good. our book, uh, Inside the Real Area 51, The Secret History of Wright-Patterson, can be uh, purchased at your friendly Barnes & Noble store, uh, if, if they're still friendly. And uh, also on Amazon, you can get it in a hardback, I mean, in a regular paperback. Uh, you can get it on Kindle. You can get it on ebook. You can get it on uh, whatever electronic version you want. They have it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tom. It's been a real pleasure. It, no, the pleasure was mine. Thank you for listening to our show, and please remember to check out our website, podcastufo.com, for the latest blogs and forums. We never like talking about money, but we rely on your support. On our sidebar, we have a subscription button where you can help us out for under the cost of a couple of cups of coffee a month. If you cannot help us out, we still appreciate every single listener. Thank you, and remember, keep your eyes to the sky. Thank you.